，洗入深圳市中心，欢送嘅市民随即欢呼。车上嘅军人就向市民敬礼同挥手致意，咁甚至乎连难得一见嘅装甲运兵车亦跟随车队轻松。Made out of lightweight polymer and aluminum alloy, sporting a bullpup design, firing a brand new small caliber high velocity cartridge, the QBZ-95 is the embodiment of Chinese military modernization. From the day it was carried into Hong Kong in the hands of a Cold War style PLA, up until the present age of modularity and ergonomics, these rifles have gone through a lot of changes. This video will be an attempt to summarize technical information about the QBZ-95 small arms family and how it evolved over the years in the context of an ever-changing combat landscape. And since they do own a semi-automatic civilian version of these rifles, some subjective observation will be provided at the end. First, an overview of the platform. The QBZ-95 family can be divided into two generations with the original 1st gen adopted in the 90s, and the improved 2nd gen with a dash 1 suffix fielded in the early 2010s. Some people refer to the 2nd gen as the QBZ-95G, but this is wrong. Before the official dash 1 designation was announced, Chinese internet users called the 2nd gen the QBZ-95 Gai, meaning altered or improved, which was then abbreviated as G. This was never an official designation. Both generations have a rifle as the standard, and a carbine with a B designation. The squad automatic weapon is designated QBB for the first generation and QJB for the second. The barrel lengths of the rifle and the saw were unchanged after the upgrade, on the other hand, the carbine barrel was slightly increased. The ammunition used by all variants in the family is the 5.8 by 42mm cartridge. In the first generation, the rifle and the carbine used the 64 grain DBP-87 or DBP-95 with the latter being non-corrosive. The saw uses the heavier 77 grain DBP-88. In the second generation, all variants share a universal cartridge, being the 71 grain DBP-10. Note that any QBZ-95 derivative from any generations can use any type of ammunition in an emergency. Aside from the domestic QBZ-95s, there is also the QBZ-97 export variant in 5.56 NATO. These include a rifle, a carbine, and a squad automatic weapon, all modeled after the first gen 95s. The civilian T-97 NSR is effectively a semi-automatic QBZ-97 rifle, with some interesting changes which I will briefly talk about near the end of the video. At this point, some people might ask, what about the QBU-88 DMR or the QCW-05 submachine gun? Well, I decided not to include them as QBZ-95 derivatives, since their inner mechanisms significantly deviate from the 95s. The QBU-88 uses an AK-style bolt carrier group, while the QBZ-95 uses an FN-FNC-style bolt carrier group. The fire control group on the QBU-88 is also similar to an AK with a pivoting hammer, while the QBZ-95 uses a linear hammer. Also, despite sharing the same cartridge, the QBU-88 and the QBZ-95 magazines are not interchangeable. As for the QCW-05 submachine gun, it uses a straight blowback mechanism and fires from an open bolt. The layout of the QCW-05 is also significantly different from the QBZ-95. 
The fire control group on the O5 is completely contained within the pistol grip and interact with this feature on the bolt. Meanwhile, the QBZ95 fire control group is contained in the receiver and is linked to the trigger via a trigger bar. I would say that the relationship between the QBU88, the QCW05, and the QBZ95 is kind of like the relationship between the SVD, the VZ58, and the AK. They look similar on the outside, but internally they are different enough to be considered different platforms. Now let's go into details about the QBZ95 family, starting with the first generation. For the sake of simplicity, you can assume that everything that I say is true for the rifle, the carbine, and the squad automatic weapon, unless I specify otherwise. The heart of the QBZ95 is a receiver milled from a solid block of forged aluminum alloy. Attached to that is a dust cover, an upper handguard, and a lower handguard, all made out of glass reinforced polymer. As you can see in this photo, all of the important bits like the barrel, the sights, and the fire control group are fixed to the aluminum receiver. This design philosophy is similar to that of the AK, where all essential components that require tight tolerances are mated to a central receiver and other auxiliary parts can be simpler with much lower tolerances. The charging handle is tucked underneath the carrying handle and reciprocates with every shot. There is a steel guide rod that runs inside the charging handle tube. The fire selector on the first gen QBZ95 is mounted all the way near the butt pad on the left side only. This selector goes from safe to full auto to semi-auto. On earlier production models, the selector is slightly different with what looks like a spring-loaded lever and a shorter throw. The magazine release is a rock and lock design. Despite this, loading the gun seems to be pretty easy due to the narrow rocking angle and a very well-designed magazine well. The release paddle itself is quite large. You can't miss it. Here is the QBZ95 magazine. Every part of this magazine, except the spring, is constructed from polymer. The magazine catch locks into these two recesses on either side of the spine. This magazine has the advantage of being designed from the ground up to be polymer, so the amount of material supporting the locking surfaces is quite substantial. There are also three witness holes on the right side of the spine to observe the round count. Note that the magazine does not have a bolt lock open feature on the last shot in the first gen QBZ95. This feature will be added in the second generation. The squad automatic weapon uses a 70 round drum magazine. If you know what the Chinese AK drum magazine looks like inside, this drum should be very familiar to you. The back of the drum can be opened to load cartridges. The drum can be loaded and stored with no spring tension, and this tab can be used to wind up the spring before use. The spring tension can also be released by pressing this button. An interesting feature of the QBZ95 drum is that it is offset to the left so that it does not get in the way of the firing hand for a right-handed shooter. Of course, the 30-round box magazine and the drum can be used interchangeably in the rifle, the carbine, and the saw. In this photo, you can see the two locking surfaces of the drum being at the same place as those of the box magazine. In the first generation of the QBZ95, there are significant differences between the handguards of the rifle, the carbine, and the squad automatic weapon. Let's start with the rifle. It's pretty basic with ribbings to increase friction and heat vents. The vertical grip integrated into the trigger guard is an iconic feature of the QBZ95. On the carbine variant, this vertical grip is much more prominent since that's pretty much the only place the support hand can hold onto because the barrel is so short. There is a thumb rest on the left side only which makes the gun friendlier to right-handed shooters. The squad automatic weapon is just beefier in general. The carry handle is thicker and has reinforcement ribs which are not present on the rifle and carbine. The lower handguard is thick to improve heat insulation. There is also a gap in the lower handguard for the bipod to hook into when folded. One additional note is that the earlier models of the rifle and the saw has three vent holes on each side of the upper handguard. These are the models with the previously mentioned short throw fire selector. On the latest model, the rifle has six vent holes while the saw has seven. The muzzle device of the rifle and the saw are simply birdcage style flash hiders. There is a spring on the flash hider of the rifle to retain a rifle grenade. The spring is not present on the muzzle device of the saw. Both the rifle and the saw have bayonet lugs. The QBZ95 carbine has an AKS-74U style booster, while the flash hiders of the rifle and the saw are pinned to the barrel. 
The booster on the carbine can be unscrewed by pulling back on this pin. Of course, a rifle grenade cannot be mounted to the carbine, nor can a bayonet. The front sight on the QBZ95 is adjustable in both windage and elevation. Windage is adjusted by sliding this drum, which will slide this whole assembly left or right. On top of that, by unscrewing this bolt, the entire front sight tower can be drifted. Elevation is adjusted by screwing or unscrewing the front sight post. These two white dots are Promethium 147 fluorescent paint used for low light aiming. Promethium 147 has a half life of about two and a half years. This combined with the fact that it's only painted on means that the night sight loses its effectiveness fairly quickly. This will be improved in the QBZ95-1, which I will describe in detail later. The rear sight on the QBZ95 rifle is a rotating drum with three apertures corresponding to 100, 300, and 500 meters. The 100 meter aperture is actually the smallest so that soldiers can shoot more accurately when qualifying at the range. In combat, they use the 500 meter aperture, which has the largest hole, and aim at the belt buckle of the target, similar to how the Russians shoot with their 400 meter combat zero. Additionally, there is this post for night aiming. On the squad automatic weapon, the glowing dot is on top of the 300 meter aperture instead of on the separate post. I cannot find details about other differences between the rear sights of the rifle, the carbine, and the saw on the first gen 95s, but based on what I can find about the second gen 95-1, it is safe to assume that the machine gun sight has apertures for longer ranges, while the carbine sight does not. Note that there is also a proprietary optics rail integrated to the rear sight tower on all variants of the QBZ95. The last external feature in the QBZ95 is the cleaning kit stored in the pistol grip. By depressing this very stiff pin, you can remove the trapdoor and take the cleaning kit out. Inside the cleaning kit is a 7-piece cleaning rod, 1 bore brush attachment, 1 cleaning patch attachment, 2 punches, 1 pentagonal key, and a front side elevation adjustment tool. An interesting detail is that you can use the 2 punches to increase leverage when screwing or unscrewing the cleaning rod sections. This concludes the external features of the first gen QBZ95, now let's get into the internal features, starting with the gas system. The QBZ95 family uses a short stroke gas piston system. This piston strikes the front of the charging handle tube, driving the bolt carrier group back. The rifle, carbine, and saw have pistons of different lengths. The gas regulator on all variants are adjustable. On the rifle, there are three settings, being normal, adverse, and gas cutoff, for launching rifle grenades. The gas regulator can be adjusted by inserting a cartridge case head into the screw here. From my personal experience, it's very easy for the case to slip out, and when the gas system is full of carbon, adjusting it this way is especially hard. The design of the adjustment mechanism will be improved on the QBZ95-1. The gas system on the saw is also adjustable in the same manner as the rifle, but I can't confirm if there is a gas cutoff setting. Since we haven't spotted a rifle grenade retaining spring on the saw, it's possible that the cutoff setting is not present because it wouldn't be necessary. The gas regulator on the carbine is significantly different from that of the rifle in the machine gun. It has two positions, which can be adjusted by pushing on this surface on this lever here. Next up is the bolt carrier group. I will use footage of a civilian Type 97 since the mechanisms are the same. You can see the charging handle is fixed to the bolt carrier here. As we have established before, the BCG on the QBZ95 is very similar to that of the FN FNC, which itself is inspired by the AK. The extractor design as well as the two locking locks are classic AK features. The ejector is this steel piece here, which is fixed to the aluminum receiver by two rivets. Of course, the ejector should be steel since it has to take repeated impacts from the cartridge case. The firing pin is free-floating, similar to an AK firing pin. Well, why did I say that the QBZ95 bolt carrier group is more similar to the FNC than the AK? First, the bolt carrier and the operating rod is manufactured as two pieces joined together afterwards. Second, the bolt cam on the QBZ is on the stem, like the FNC bolt, not on the head like an AK bolt. Third, the closing of the QBZ bolt is initiated with a secondary cam on the bolt head, similar to the FNC. This brings us to an interesting detail that I don't see many people mention about AK-inspired bolt carrier groups. Here you can see that on the QBZ, 
When the bolt is in the unlocked position, the contact between the main cam lug and the bolt carrier is a flat surface. This means that when the bolt carrier is traveling forward to pick up a cartridge, zero torque is applied to the bolt. When the bolt is almost all the way forward, the secondary cam on the bolt head contacts a slanted surface on the trunnion, which initiates bolt rotation. After this initiation, the flat surfaces on the main cam lug and the bolt carrier is no longer in alignment and the bolt can now be closed the rest of the way by the cam groove on the bolt carrier. The FNC uses the same secondary cam to initiate bolt rotation, while on the AK, a camming surface is built into one of the locking lugs. This mechanism is one of the advantages of an AK-style bolt carrier group over an AR-15 or AR-18-style bolt carrier group. On AR bolt carrier groups, there's no flat surfaces between the cam lug and the cam groove, so there's always a torque applied to the bolt when it's pushed forward. In the case of the AR-15, this means that the steel cam pin grinds against the aluminum cam track on the upper receiver, which is less than optimal for long-term durability. This is why some AR variants like the SIG MCX has steel reinforcements in the cam track. Some other manufacturers like Patriot Ordnance Factory put a roller on their cam pin. Sorry for the long tangent, back to the QBZ. As you can see right now, the hammer is all the way forward, touching the firing pin. If I move the bolt carrier back, you will see that as the back of the bolt carrier contacts the hammer, the bolt is still locked. The bolt only unlocks fully when the bolt carrier moves back more, separating the hammer from the firing pin. This ensures that the hammer cannot reach the firing pin if the bolt is unlocked. Another interesting detail is this hole in the trunnion. I don't know for sure, but I think this hole serves two purposes. First is to direct the gases away from the shooter's face in the event of a catastrophic failure. While the gases will be redirected into your firing hand, that's why I'm not sure about the specific purpose of the hole, but I guess it's better than a face full of shrapnel. The second purpose is to drain foreign debris away from the locking lugs. We have all seen the infamous in-ranged mud test on the AK in which the bolt carrier struggles to go into battery. I suspect that this failure is due to the accumulation of debris in this specific area between the feed ramp and the locking lugs. The QBZ95 does not have a feed ramp in the same location as the AK, also this hole should drain any mud accumulated in the trunnion. Therefore, I suspect that the QBZ95 will perform better in a mud test. Only one way to find out. I loaded the gun with M855 since that's recommended in the user manual. The gas setting is 1, normal. Pretty impressive. In fact, I was so impressed that I reloaded the magazine and tried to continue firing. This time I ran out of M855 so I loaded it with Barno 62 grain lacquered steel case. The gun started to experience difficulty going into battery and ejecting. At which point I thought, huh, maybe I shouldn't have dumped all the rounds into the snow and reload them into the dirty magazine. So I tried again, this time loading clean rounds into a clean magazine, while as clean as possible with my hands full of mud. I also switched the gas setting to adverse. The trigger failed to reset a few times. As you can see, the gun got through the magazine okay, even with mud in the trunnion. I do apologize for the jump cuts, at first I only intended to fire one magazine. I also showed you the trunnion every time to prove that I did not clean the gun between cuts. And I think this video is long enough already. All in all, I think the trunnion design in the QBZ is a slight improvement over the AK, since it leaves more space for the locking lugs to push debris out of the way. On the other hand, the trigger failing to reset is probably due to the mud getting on the trigger bar, which runs along the left side of the receiver. Now let's get into the fire control group. As mentioned before, the QBZ95 uses a linear hammer. I call it a linear hammer because unlike a striker on the clock that directly strikes the primer, 
This piece on the QBZ strikes the firing pin. The remaining components of the trigger pack are as follows. This is the trigger bar that connects the trigger to the fire control group. As you pull the trigger, this bar is pulled forward which pulls in this red piece here. Let's call it the actuator since it actuates the rest of the components to start the firing sequence. This green piece is the main sear which holds the hammer in the cocked position before firing. This blue piece is the disconnector which holds the hammer during semi-auto fire. This purple piece is the auto sear which holds the hammer during full auto fire. The orange piece is the auto sear lever, it trips the auto sear when the bolt carrier is fully closed. This yellow piece is the fire selector. It is held in place by this flat spring. Now let's see how these components work. This is the hammer in the cocked position, being held back by the main sear. When the gun is in the safe position, the shaft of the fire selector blocks the main sear from dropping. To put the gun in full auto, the fire selector is rotated 90 degrees. In this position, a notch on the selector allows the main sear to be depressed. Additionally, the disconnector is blocked from rising by the fire selector shaft. As you pull the trigger, the actuator will pivot counterclockwise, at which point this protrusion will interact with the main sear, moving it down. This allows the hammer to strike forward, firing a cartridge. The bolt carrier and the hammer are then sent back. At the same time, the back end of the auto sear rises under spring pressure. When the hammer finishes the backward motion and moves forward again under spring pressure, it is caught by the auto sear. As the bolt carrier continues forward and reaches its frontmost position, the auto sear lever is tripped, which in turn strips the auto sear, releasing the hammer, firing another cartridge. This process is stopped when the shooter releases the trigger, allowing the main sear to rise up and catch the hammer. Next is the semi-automatic mode, where the fire selector is rotated another 90 degrees. This time a notch on the fire selector allows the disconnector to move up. Note that the auto sear still functions in semi-automatic mode as an out of battery safety, but since it doesn't contribute to the actual firing sequence, I will hide it for now for the sake of clarity. When you pull the trigger, again, the main sear will be depressed. At the same time, the tail of the actuator goes up, which allows the disconnector to rise due to spring pressure. However, the disconnector is positioned slightly behind the main sear so it cannot catch the hammer yet. When the main sear drops and the hammer fires, the disconnector fully rises. As the bolt carrier and the hammer travels back and then forward again, the hammer is caught by the disconnector. When the shooter releases the trigger, the main seal rises, and at the same time, the tail of the actuator depresses the disconnector. This frees the hammer from the disconnector, allowing it to be caught by the main seal, resetting the firing sequence. Once again in full speed. And now with the auto seer. You will see that if the bolt carrier is at any position other than fully closed, the auto seer will be raised to catch the hammer. Before we leave the fire control group, I'd like to bring your attention to a few other details. First, three parts, being the actuator, the main sear and the disconnector, share the same spring. It is unclear whether the auto sear also share this spring, because I modeled this trigger after the one on my semi-auto civilian Type 97, and the only reference I have for the auto sear is this diagram. Nevertheless, the fact that three major fire control components share this one spring is ingenious. The other detail that I wanted to point out is that the tension spring for the fire selector can also be used to remove the fire control group without tools. This extremely effective use of components with multiple functions led me to believe that the engineers that designed the QBZ-95 were absolutely brilliant, and the atrocious placement of the fire selector is probably due to a different design philosophy, or maybe they were just good engineers but not frequent shooters.
Also, another minor detail is that the pin for the auto sear lever is sticked into the receiver, which indicates that the lever is intended to be semi-permanently fixed for some reason. The last internal mechanism is this buffer. This piece pivots around the takedown pin in the receiver. When the bolt carrier group travels back, it hits the top of the steel lever, and the bottom piece, which is loaded with a very stiff spring, hits this surface inside the receiver, which is actually a steel plate. As you can see, this mechanism dampens the impact of the bolt carrier group, and all the components that are subjected to that impact is made from steel. Not only does this soften the felt recoil, but it also reduces the stress on the aluminum receiver. And with that, we conclude the analysis of the first generation QBZ95. Now let's get into the improved QBZ95-1. To keep this short, I will only go into the features in the QBZ95-1 that are different from the QBZ95. You can assume that the features that I do not mention are the same between the two generations. And of course, unless I specify otherwise, what I say applies to all variants, being the carbine, the rifle, and the squad automatic weapon. Let's start from the outside. The most significant quality of life improvement on the 95-1 is the placement of the fire selector. No longer are the days of reaching into your armpit to disengage the safety or change fire modes. The selector on the QBZ95-1 is now located next to the right hand's thumb. However, this selector is only on the left side. As you can see, the order of the firing modes is kept the same as the first gen 95, going from safe to full auto to semi-auto. The magazines for the QBZ95-1 are very similar to the original QBZ95 magazines, with some improvements. First, the base plate is now made of metal for increased durability. Next, the witness holes are now present on both sides. Last but most importantly, the 95-1 magazines can lock open the bolt after the last shot. The back of the follower is exposed, which activates the bolt catch when the follower reaches the top position. Of course, the 95 and 95-1 magazines can be used interchangeably in both generations. However, a 95 magazine will not lock the bolt on a QBZ 95-1. The bolt release is tucked into the receiver behind the magazine release. In this diagram, you can see how the bolt catch bolt release work. The protrusion on the follower pushes up on this red plunger which catches the bolt. The bolt release paddle pivots around this pin. Pushing the paddle up will force the plunger down, releasing the bolt. The pin for the bolt release is actually visible on either side of the receiver, as seen here. This is one of the ways you can distinguish the QBZ95-1 from the QBZ95. The 95-1 has two pins, the other one being the auto sear lever pin. Meanwhile, the QBZ95 does not have a bolt release, so you can only see the auto sear lever pin. Interestingly, the 95-1 squad automatic weapon also has a bolt catch, even with a drum magazine. However, I cannot find a photo, nor a diagram of the 95-1 drum, but it also probably has an exposed follower, like the 30 rounder, to engage the bolt catch. The next external difference between the 95-1 and the 95s are the polymer handguards. For the second gen 95-1, the rifle, the carbine, and the saw has very similar handguards, with slanted rippings, while the first gen 95s have vertical rippings. One of the reported problems of the first gen is fast overheating of the handguards, so the handguards on the second gen are supposed to have better heat dissipation. Also note that the ribbings on the earlier 95-1s are slanted the same way as the pistol grip, while on newer guns the ribbings are slanted the opposite way. You probably notice that the integral front grip on the trigger guard of the 95s are not present on the 95-1s. The removal of this front grip is to facilitate a mounting stud for an underbarrel grenade launcher. This mounting point is a steel piece attached to the barrel, as you can see in this diagram. The other mounting point is the bayonet lock collar. The grip angle on the 95-1s are also reduced compared to the 95s, being 75 and 81 degrees respectively. On the first gen 95, the lower handguard is very angular near the pistol grip, which slightly rubs into their knuckles. This gets uncomfortable over time, so on the 95-1s, these areas are contoured to fit the hand better. Now let's look into the differences between the handguards on the 95-1 rifle, carbine, and saw. 
The carbine handguard, being the shortest, has no heat vents at all. The rifle has 5 heat vents on each side, and the saw has 6. Also, even though they look very similar, the handguard on the saw is actually much thicker than that of the rifle and the carbine. You can see that the bottom of the rifle and the carbine handguards are slightly higher than this edge here, while on the saw they're at the same height. A final detail about the handguards on the 95-1s is that the slanted surface here is added to give more clearance for the sling. On the first gen 95s, the sling hook usually collides with the handguard. The carry handle is also upgraded on the second generation. The Dash 1 rifle and carbine carry handles now have reinforcement ribs and are much thicker than the first gen counterparts. The saw, of course, has the thickest carry handle. Since the height over bore of the iron sights is reduced on the 95-1, the carry handle height is also reduced. You can see in this video where this factory, for some reason, put a 95 upper handguard on a 95-1 rifle, the rear sights on the rifle hovers inside the charging handle slot. The back of the carry handle, where it interfaces with the top cover, is also different between the 95 and the 95-1. While we're at the carry handle, Let's talk about the charging handle as well. The charging handle on the 95-1 is a shark fin shape, while on the 95 it's more squared. The Dash 1 charging handle is also taller by 3mm. And of course, it still reciprocates. One of the classic problems of bullpups is that they're not left-hander friendly. The original QBZ95 already throw the brass roughly in the 2 o'clock direction, but on the QBZ95-1s, the ejection port is moved even further forward, which pretty much directs the spent cases to 1 o'clock. I think while it's not optimal, it has come to a point where a left-hander can comfortably run the 95-1. On the rifle variant, the second gen muzzle device externally looks very similar to the first gen. However, the pin that connects it to the barrel has been redesigned, because on the first gen when the blank firing adapter is mounted, it transfers the gas pressure onto the muzzle device, which sometimes can yank it off the barrel. Here you can see that the rifle grenade retaining spring is also present on the 95-1 muzzle device. On the second gen saw, again, there's no retaining spring. And of course, here's the bayonet lug. The most drastic change would be the muzzle device on the carbine. It is now a regular flash hider instead of a booster like on the gen 1. Note that this muzzle device is a bit conical. There is also no gas rings nor bayonet lugs on the carbine, however there is this slot underneath the muzzle device for a grenade launcher to lock into. The iron sights on the QBZ95-1 are also improved compared to the first generation. First is the front sight. The 95-1 front sight is only adjustable for elevation by screwing or unscrewing the front sight post. The night sights are now embedded tritium tubes, which has much better durability and longer half-life compared to the promethium fluorescent paint on the older Gen 1s. This extra thick front sight protector that houses tritium tubes is a prominent distinguishing feature between a 95-1 and a 95. Another upgrade on the 95-1 front sight tower is these proprietary rails here, which are present on both sides, to which you can mount lights and lasers. Next is the rear sight. The basic design is still similar to the first gen QBZ95 with multiple apertures that can be rotated into position. However, the 95-1 rear sight is now adjustable for windage by taking a flathead screwdriver to this hole here. The adjustment mechanism is shown more clearly when the carry handle is taken off. My initial impression is that the thicker body of the aperture on the 95-1s will make for a much cleaner sight picture compared to the original 95s. On the original 95s, there is very little material around the peephole, which means that the rear sight tends to disappear, especially in suboptimal lighting conditions. Also, recall how on the original 95 rifle, the rear sight is ranged at 100, 300, and 500 meters, where the 100 meter aperture is the smallest, so that soldiers can score higher in rifle qualifications. On the QBZ 95 1 rifles, the rear sights are set up for 300. 400 and 500 meters, and there are actually two apertures for 300 meters. One is small for target shooting and one is larger for combat. You can see these two apertures in this photo, both marked with the number 3. Additionally, the night sight, which is now upgraded to tritium, is embedded under the larger 300 meter aperture. 
For the 95-1 carbine, the rear sight is only ranged for 100 and 300 meters. Again, there are two different apertures with different hole diameters for 300 meters. Additionally, there are two apertures marked X1 and X3, which corresponds to 100 and 300 meters when the grenade launcher is mounted. As far as I can tell, these are not to aim the grenade launcher itself, but to account for the point of impact shift of the carbine when you mount the grenade launcher. Although it's very blurry, you can vaguely see the X3 marking in this photo. On the 95-1 squad automatic weapon, the rear sight is set to 300, 400, 500, 600, and 700 meters. And I couldn't find any information about the hole diameters. The final important detail, which I have briefly mentioned before, is that the height over bore is reduced by 5mm on all second gen variants. This is to make aiming with optical sights more comfortable. The last external feature we are going to look at on the improved QBZ95-1 is the cleaning kit. First, the button that holds the cleaning kit trapdoor in place is now enlarged and knurled. This is much better than the spring-loaded pin on the original 95, which is so small and so stiff that it's next to impossible to depress by hand. The content of the cleaning kit are as follows. A front sight tool, a bore brush attachment, a cleaning rod extension piece, a cleaning patch attachment, a hole punch, a pentagonal key, whatever this is, and a brush. You might wonder where's the cleaning rod. Well, as shown in these videos, it's stowed in the receiver. Pretty cool. Now let's get into the internals. One of the most important changes on the QBZ95-1 compared to the original 95 is the change in ammunition. In the second gen 95-1s, the rifle, carbine, and saw uses the same cartridge with a 71 grain bullet, heavier than the 64 grain bullet of the first gen rifle and carbine. To stabilize this heavier bullet, the rifling twist rate of the rifle and carbine are increased from 1 in 240mm in the first gen to 1 in 210mm in the second gen. Coincidentally, 1 in 210mm is also the twist rate for the squad automatic weapon for both the first and second gen. The number of riflings was also increased from 4 to 6 to disperse the force of the bullet into a larger area, reducing the stress in each rifling. The diameter of the lens is slightly increased, while the diameter of the grooves is slightly reduced. And I should repeat that all variants of the 5.8 cartridge can be fired by all members of the QBZ95 family, both 1st and 2nd gen, in an emergency. Next up is the gas system. Of course, it's still a short stroke piston system. The most significant change is in the carbine, where the booster muzzle device is no longer needed. It is also said that the internal volume of the gas block on the carbine has been increased to reduce gas pressure, thereby reducing the muzzle flash, report, and felt recoil in this shorty boy. The next important change is the gas setting adjustment mechanism. On the 95-1s, the gas settings can be adjusted by inserting the neck of a cartridge case into this hole on the regulator, push forward, and then turn. This gives the user much more leverage to turn the gas regulator compared to the adjustment mechanism on the first gen 95s. Again, the rifle retained the three settings of normal, adverse, and cutoff. It is unclear if the cutoff setting is present on the carbine and the squad automatic weapon. I am fairly sure that it's not on the squad weapon, because in this video, the saw can still fire when the gas regulator is pointing up vertically, which would normally be the cutoff setting on the rifle. The bolt carrier group on the 95-1 is pretty much the same as that of the original 95, so let's skip that and get into the fire control group. I regret to tell you that I wasn't able to find a diagram that fully explains the function of the 95-1 trigger pack, but let's go over what we do know. This is probably the most helpful diagram, despite the fact that the cleaning rod obscures a lot of important details. In this diagram, you can see the main sear in green and the auto sear in red. The auto sear works identically to that of the original QBZ95, where it is tripped by a separate auto sear lever. The main sear is depressed by this actuator, which itself is operated by this trigger bar. You can see the shape of the actuator more clearly in this screenshot. As the trigger bar pulls forward on the actuator, this piece pushes down on the main sear and releases the hammer. Note that this piece is spring loaded, which will be important later. This clip shows the function of the trigger pack during full auto fire. As you can see, the actuator just holds the main sear down 
while the auto seal catches and releases the hammer just like on the original QBZ95. The semi-automatic mode is a bit trickier. These parts here, let's call them the disconnector assembly, is responsible for semi-automatic function, but they're hidden behind the cleaning rod in this diagram. As you can see in this video, they still move when the gun is in full auto, but they don't interact with the other parts of the fire control group at all. Now look at this area. You can see that this protrusion on the trigger bar is the only way the fire control group interacts with the fire selector. That means that the QBZ95-1 almost certainly uses a progressive trigger design, where a short pull of the trigger gives you a single shot, and a long pull gives you full auto. All the fire selector does is limit or not limit the pull of the trigger depending on which fire mode you're in. This is in fact how the fire selector works in most bullpup where it is located near the pistol grip, like the FAMAS, the F2000, or the Tavor. Based on this, I would hypothesize that during semi-automatic mode, the actuator is given a shallower pull, placing it in a position where the disconnector can somehow retract the spring-loaded piece, thereby allowing the main sear to rise and catch the hammer. How exactly does it do that? The only clue I have is this two-second clip of a disassembled QBZ95-1 trigger pack. This mystery piece here is probably this piece in this diagram, and this spring corresponds to this spring. The mystery piece sits on the same axis as the actuator. I believe this piece plays a major role in the semi-automatic mode, but I have stared at this two-second clip for days. If I do it more, I'll go insane. So I apologize for the incomplete information. Maybe I'll upload a separate video if I ever figure it out, but that's for another day. Also note a few details in this screenshot. The hammer of the QBZ95-1 only has one protrusion on the right side which interacts with both the main sear and the auto sear. This makes sense as the cleaning rod is stored on the left side, which means there's no space for any interaction with the trigger group on that side. The disconnector seems to interact with this cutout underneath the bolt carrier, which matches what happens in this video. A few more details about the 95-1 trigger pack. Again, it is still contained in a sheet metal housing, and can be quickly removed by pushing this captive pin out to the right. If you look at this photo of the left side of the receiver, you can see how the trigger pack housing pin is much more low profile than the main takedown pin to remove the top cover, which prevents grunts from mistakenly taking out the trigger pack during field strips. Also, how do we know this pin is captive? If you look on the right side, you can see this rib connecting the main takedown pin and the trigger pack housing pin. Underneath this rib would be two detents loaded by the same spring, one for the takedown pin and one for the trigger pack pin. If you know how the AR-15 takedown pin detent works, these are exactly the same, only there are two detents on both ends of the spring. I also want to have a word about the safety selector on the 95-1 compared to the 95. As we all know, the placement of the selector on the original 95 is horrendous and the 95-1 eliminated this problem. However, the safety on the 95 was technically safer. If you remember, the QBZ-95 safety directly blocks the main sear from moving, while on the 95-1, the safety only blocks the trigger bar. Theoretically, the main sear can still move under its own inertia if you whack the gun against something hard enough, but this is a very big if, and practically it shouldn't be a problem. Maybe you need to drop the gun from space to make this tiny piece move under its own inertia against spring pressure, but this might explain why the safety on the original 95 is placed where it is. Also, the 95-1 is not the only gun with this type of safety either. A few other guns that use the same pattern of safety are the F2000, the Star AUG, the SKS, and the HKMR556. Another advantage of the 95-1 selector is that you can cock the hammer while the gun is on safe, whereas you cannot do that on the original 95. The last internal change on the 95-1 is the modified recoil buffer. It now uses a torsion spring instead of a compression spring like on the original 95. Since the torsion spring takes up less space, this protrusion near the buttstock of the 95-1 is slimmer than that of the 95 which is another feature that you can look at to differentiate between the two generations. Note that this step on the top cover of the 95-1 is also less pronounced. That concludes the analysis of the firearms themselves. 
Now let's get into the accessories, starting with the QNL95 bayonet. This bayonet for the QBZ95 family looks suspiciously similar to the USM9 bayonet. The blade itself has a saw back and a hole to interface with the scabbard to form a wire cutter. There is also a sharpening stone on the scabbard. Next up is the YMA95 series of optical sights. This is a fixed 3x magnified optic with a QD mount compatible with all firearms in the QBZ95 family. These caps protect the windage and elevation adjustment screws. One click of these screws equals 0.25 mm radians, which translate to a point of impact shift of 2.5 cm at a range of 100 m, or roughly 0.86 MOA. Here is the reticle on the YMA95. This cross on top is for factory calibration and can't be used for aiming. These marks, which are identical on both sides, are for stadiometric ranging of a man-sized target at up to 700 meters. This is done by aligning the shoulder of the target with either a hash mark or a gap between two marks. For example, this target is 200 meters away, this target is 400 meters away, and this target is 700 meters away. Once you have ranged the target, you can use these bullet drop compensated aiming points, starting from the cross at the middle for targets under 200 meters, going all the way up to 800 meters. Note that the 7 and 800 meter marks are for the saw variant alone. The rifle can only use up to the 600 meter mark. I'm not sure about the carbine. The YMA95 houses a lithium battery in a compartment underneath the scope. With this, the reticle can be illuminated by turning on this switch. It is unclear if the brightness is adjustable. Just like the QBZ95-1 is an improvement of the QBZ95, the YMA95-1-600 is an improvement of the YMA95. The overall specification for the Dash 1s are pretty similar to the originals, being 3x magnification and the same amount of adjustment per click. The reticle is also very similar. Bullet drop hash marks are the same as the older reticle, while the stadiometric ranging marks are a little different. Most of the improvements in the YMA95-1 is in quality of life. First, the battery compartment is moved to the side of the scope instead of below the scope, in order to reduce height over bore. You can see in these photos how the Dash 1 scope sits noticeably lower than the original. The new scope also uses commercially available CR13N batteries. Reticle illumination is now turned on using this switch on top of the optic. The design of the QD lever is also changed. Now it is tucked underneath the scope, out of the way, and the lever itself protrudes to the right side. I suspect that this change was made because on the original scope, the entire mechanism sticks out to the left, which is in the perfect position to catch on gear for a right-handed shooter. The last little upgrade is this sunshade on the objective lens here. This is the light intensifying night vision optic paired with the first gen QBZ95. This is the only clue I have for the designation of this scope, which seems to be YMG95 something. In this photo, you can see how windage and elevation seems to be adjusted externally using these two screws, which move the entire body of the optic. Similar to the YMAs, this scope has a 3x magnification and a QD mount. The reticle has bullet drop hash marks out to 600 meters. However, the effective range at which the scope can spot a standing man in a moonless, starry night is listed as 200 meters. The focus ring at the front has these markings to indicate direction of focus, and here is the diopter adjustment ring. Again, with the introduction of the improved QBZ95-1, another improved night vision optic designated MGL95-1-300 was also introduced. The manufacturer's website says the magnification is 3x, but I've seen 4x floating around in some other articles. The battery compartment on the side houses two CR2 batteries, and this knob is used to turn the scope on and off, as well as to adjust brightness. As usual, we have a focus ring in the front and a diopter adjustment ring at the back. Elevation and windage adjustment now happens internally, via screws protected under these caps. The amount of adjustment is 0.25 mm radians per click, same as the YMA series of optics. Internal windage and elevation adjustments means that the scope mount can be much smaller, thereby reducing the height of a bore. The MGL also has an increased effective range of 300 meters for a man-sized target, 
compared to the 200 meters of the previous YMG night vision optic. The reticle also changed, with much more modest bullet drop compensation only out to 300 meters. As I have mentioned before, the improved QBZ95-1 has proprietary dovetail rails on the front side tower to mount various accessories. One of the accessories that is designed to fit these rails is the QMQMJ laser aiming module. This module emits a 650 nanometer beam, aka a visible red laser, with a power of 4.58 to 5 milliwatts. The beam divergence is 1 milliradian, which is to say it's going to put a 10 centimeter dot on a target at 100 meters, around 3.44 MOA. The effective range of this laser is 150 meters. The module uses a CR2 battery, which is the same type that the MGL NetVision Optic uses. This battery can power the laser for 10 hours. There is also this flashlight, which can be mounted to the same rail as the laser, but I cannot find any technical information for this one. Next up is the underbarrel grenade launchers. First is the Type 91, which is a non-lethal 35mm riot control grenade launcher, with an effective range of 350 meters. Even though I couldn't find any diagrams, most sources say that the operating mechanism is very similar to the M203. The Type 91 series comes in four configurations, which are mounted to different platforms. We're going to focus on the QLG-91B, which goes on the QBZ-95 rifle. The launcher is mounted by sliding this frame over the rifle barrel, where the front end sits on the flash hider, and the rear end sits on the bayonet lug collar. This button locks the grenade launcher to the bayonet lug. Also visible in this photo is the manual safety on the right side. If we look at the left side, we can see the tube release button and the mechanical sight. Weighing almost 1.5 kilos, with a length of over 30 centimeters, this grenade launcher is more cumbersome than the M203, even though it fires a smaller caliber. This is where the Type 10 comes in. With the development of the improved QBZ95-1, the Type 10 series was designed from the ground up to be a lethal underbarrel grenade launcher, unlike the non-lethal Type 91. It comes in two variants, being the QLG-10A for the second gen QBZ-95-1 and the QLG-10 for the original QBZ-95. As one would expect, the biggest difference between these two variants is the mounting system. The QLG-10 mounts like a Type 91, where the mount is slid over the rifle barrel with the front end resting on the muzzle device and the rear end resting on the bayonet lock collar. With this mounting system, the QLG-10 can only be mounted on the rifle variant of either the QBZ-95 or the QBZ-95-1. The QLG-10A, on the other hand, can be mounted on both the rifle and carbine variants of the 95-1. On the rifle, the front mount sits on the bayonet lock collar, while the rear pin slides into this hole in front of the trigger guard, which we have discussed earlier. On the carbine, the rear pin mates with the same hole, but the front mount slides over the muzzle device and locks into this notch here. Both QLG-10 variants use a 35mm caseless grenade loaded into the launch tube from the muzzle. Both has mechanical sights on the left side, which are ranged for 100 to 400 meters, in increments of 50 meters. Range adjustment is made by rotating this whole assembly to your desired range on this scale. Note that the rear sight has two notches. When shooting at targets under 100 meters, the side assembly is rotated to the 100 meter mark, and the small notch is used to aim. When shooting at 100 meters or further, rotate the side assembly to the corresponding mark and use the larger notch. Also note that there is a dovetail on the side assembly that allows the mounting of the YMAL 10-35 red dot sight. Both grenade launchers employ three safety mechanisms. First is the manual safety on the left side. Second is this tab on top which will be depressed when the launcher is mounted on a gun, ensuring that the launcher can only be fired when it is mounted correctly. Third is a pin that protrudes into the chamber face, which only allows the striker to drop when the grenade is fully seated. You can also see the detent in this photo, which holds the grenade in the tube so that it doesn't fall out when you point the muzzle down. To unload the launcher, you can press this tab forward, which will push the grenade out the muzzle. In this photo, the launcher is unloaded, so this tab is in the forward position. The QLG-10A also has what looks like a trigger safety, but this is not mentioned in any sources I found. Next up is the blank firing adapter. This is a two-piece design, including a connecting sleeve and a gas restriction plug. To attach the device to the muzzle, unscrew these two screws using the provided hex key, open up this clamp, 
slide this over the flash hider from the side, such that the shoulder is behind the flash hider. This is what keeps the adapter from being thrown forward. After that, screw in the gas plug from the front, ensuring that the previously mentioned shoulder is tight against the back of the flash hider. Lastly, close the clamp and tighten the screws. The end result looks like this. On a side note, I frequently see a lot of comments on video of PLA training saying that their ammo is very smoky. Nah, that's just their blanks, which has a disintegrating plastic bullet. Every time you see those thick clouds of black smoke, you will also see this fat color near the muzzle. That's an easily identifiable feature of the blank firing adapter. I guess it doesn't help that these videos are sometimes mistitled live fire training. The next muzzle accessory is the suppressor. I couldn't find any information about these other than the fact that they are supposed to be quick detachable. The 58 by 42 millimeter, being a supersonic cartridge, would still probably sound pretty loud out of the suppressor. You can reduce the sound by having a subsonic load, of course, but since the mass of the projectile is relatively low, a subsonic velocity would equate to suboptimal terminal performance. That concludes the quote-unquote state-owned accessory lineup for the QBZ95 family, which seems pretty underwhelming, especially compared to the other side of the pond. If you look up Chinese special forces on YouTube, you'll probably find cheesy 80s action movie style videos with mostly bone stock guns. Well, the majority of advancements in firearms accessories and personal gear in China can be seen in the People's Armed Police, a paramilitary law enforcement organization. Their expected combat environment mainly involves small-scale CQB engagements, where personal skills and equipment play a larger role. And as such, personnel from this branch are given much more freedom to modify their service weapons. In other words, their gears are much more Gucci, if you will. Two private companies stand at the forefront of the QBZ95 accessories market. The first one is ACP, and the second one is the Shenzhen Defender Industrial Design Company, or Defender for short. The most notable rail system from ACP is the ACP95 series. The earlier version of this rail follows the same profile of the original polymer carry handle. Picatinny rails are present on top of the gas piston area and on the carry handle itself. The original proprietary scope mount is still exposed and usable. While it's not very visible in these photos, there are holes on the side of the handguard to mount additional Picatinny rails if you so desire. The more recent and more common variation of the ACP95 rails has this full-length carry handle that looks like one of a mouse at first glance. This variant is also referred to by the name Peak as marked on the side here. There are plenty of holes for you to mount additional pick rails anywhere on the carry handle. These rails have multiple configurations to mount on either the QBZ95 or QBZ95-1. Interestingly, there are also versions that completely cover the top of the carry handle with the pick rails, while some versions retain the proprietary scope mount. There is also a configuration with a short top rail, similar to the first gen ACP95. Additionally, this bottom rail is also part of the peak package. This one makes use of the grenade launcher mount inside the trigger guard of the 95-1, and a bayonet lug. All in all, these ACP rails replace the polymer upper handguard slash carry handle without any permanent modification to the original gun. I haven't personally used them, obviously, but the online review seems to say that they are very heavy and requires a lot of screws to mount. They do hold zero, though. Now let's go over the products from Defender. One of their older products is the DF95 handguard rails. These wrap over the handguard portion of the rifle. This is the weakness of the design, because once you install the rail, you can't take the upper and lower handguards off. But you don't have to do that to remove the bolt carrier group and gas system, so that's not too bad. Some newer variants of the DF95 can be installed with the top half only, so you can still take off the lower handguard at least. Of course, there are configurations for both the QBZ95 and 95-1. I checked their website, and there's even a variant for the 95B-1 carbine, but I've never seen it in the field. Next up is the longbow rail, which has a lot of impressive features. Similar to the ACP-95, it replaces the plastic upper handguard without any modification to the gun. The assembly process is literally the same as the original handguard. The rail mates with the front side tower and the dovetail scope rail, and it's supposed to have very tight fit in order to hold zero. If the fit is not tight enough, 
retention screws can be installed through these two holes to clamp the rail into the gun. As you can see, the rail system makes very liberal use of lightning cuts and was able to achieve a weight of 160 grams or less. For context, the original plastic handguard is 150 grams. These top rails are permanent, while the side rails are mounted to these holes near the gas tube portion. Again, there are configurations for the 95s, as well as the 95-1 rifles, and the 95B-1 carbines. As a side note, on the version that mounts to the original QBZ95, this enlarged opening is present at the front of the charging handle slot so that you can reach the charging handle more easily. On the version that fits the 95-1s, the opening extends to around 80% of the slot, such that when the bolt locks back, this angled surface will guide your finger right into the charging handle. The longbow rail system seems pretty well designed, both mechanically and user experience wise. Outside of the previous two companies, there are also other manufacturers that make accessories for the QBZ95. These 95s have Picatinny rails that are molded into the polymer lower handguard. The variant with metal rails was adopted by the military. There are also these Picatinny rail sections that mounts on the proprietary dovetail rails of the 95-1 front side tower. Other rail sections can be adapted to the proprietary scope mount. There is also this rail system for the 95-1 rifle, which I couldn't find out who's the manufacturer. The name for this rail apparently Google translates to Spirit Dragon Armor. I don't know if it also sounds that silly in Mandarin. This rail replaces the plastic upper handguard, similar to the ACP and longbow rails. The original scope rail on the 95-1 is still usable. Additionally, it has a set of brackets that mounts to the upper rail and wraps around the lower handguard, giving you more Picatinny rails in the 3, 6, and 9 o'clock positions. That concludes the accessories section of this video. Now I will briefly talk about the QBZ-97 export variants and my experience using their civilian counterpart, the T-97 NSR. Essentially, the QBZ-97 is just a first-gen QBZ-95 with a 5.56 barrel, bolt, gas system, and a magwell for Stanak magazines. It also has the addition of a bolt catch, but there's no external bolt release like on the 95-1. The fire control group is the same as the first-gen 95, and as such, the horrendous placement of the fire selector is also the same. But there is a minor difference being the arrangement of the fire modes, going from safe to semi to full auto. Interestingly, the earlier QBZ-97 have the same vertical foregrip integrated into the trigger guard like the first gen QBZ-95, but at some point this foregrip was removed. However, it should be noted that this change has nothing to do with the QBZ-95-1 upgrade. On the 95-1, the geometry and structure of the polymer handguards were significantly altered, both aesthetically and functionally, to accommodate the fire selector and the grenade launcher mounting stud. When the foregrip was removed on the QBZ-97, that's literally it. There's no other changes. In fact, this photo from 2007, way before the QBZ-95-1 was revealed, has already shown a QBZ-97 without the foregrip. Another change between the older and newer QBZ-97 was the magwell. In this photo of an older 97, you can see that the magwell is squared and blocky, and it has a very nice bevel at the opening. In this photo of a newer 97, the magwell has these radii at the front and back, but the bevels are gone. The magwells on the civilian T-97 rifles are modeled after the newer QBZ-97, and let me tell you, there's no beveling at all. As for the magazine release, there's this tiny button on the right side only, near the back of the magwell. Another downgrade in the civilian variant is the front sight. Early T-97s imported into Canada has the same front sight tower as the military QBZ-97, where the entire front side tower can be drifted laterally to adjust windage. But in the newer imports, only this drum is drifted, similar to an AK or SKS front sight. At this point, I think Norinko is intentionally downgrading their export weapons. Oh yeah, and the QBZ-97s, both military and civilian, don't have the fluorescent paint night sights, but they still retain the rear night sight post, which has caused a lot of head scratching among users. And what is that supposed to be? The two final details are the muzzle device and the bayonet lug. The earlier QBZ-97 uses a shorter, A2 birdcage looking flash hider, 
while the newer 97s and the semi-automatic version both return to the original QBZ95 flash hider design. Finally, the civilian version does not have a bayonet lug. Okay, now for my subjective experience with the gun. I've had this one for around 2 years, with about 3000 rounds through it. Starting with the trigger, I know what people think about bullpup triggers, but honestly I think it's not bad. First, you have this very light take up here. This is just to remove the slack between the trigger, the trigger bar, and the actuator in the fire control group. After that, you reach a wall. It's a very subtle wall, but it's there. And from here, you have a very light and pretty smooth pull until the hammer drops at an unexpected point. You cannot feel when it's gonna drop. Now here's the reset. I find that with practice, once you can feel the wall, the trick is to go to that wall, then pull through it in a quick decisive motion. Because of how smooth and light the trigger is, you can pull it past the breaking point without disrupting the sight picture. Overall, if you want an uber short, uber light gamer trigger, the QBZ95 is not for you. But I find that if you're willing to take the QBZ95 trigger for the service rifle trigger that it is, and practice with it, it will certainly allow you to reach a decent level of marksmanship. Keep in mind that I'm not Paul Harrell by any stretch, so my performance is hindering the gun, not the other way around. Okay, now for the magazine release. The placement is suboptimal, but you can get used to it. Retention reloads are also not a problem. I find the lack of beveling in the mag wall bothers me more than the placement of the mag release. Also, the mag release button itself is a staked nut, and it has these sharp edges for a screwdriver. So after a long practice session, it's going to be a bit uncomfortable. This is in stark contrast with the large, rounded paddle release on the QBZ-95s, so Norinko can design a user-friendly magazine catch, they just don't care about foreigners. The T-97 is very picky with magazines. On my gun, P-Mags don't fit at all, and the cross mags sit so low that sometimes the bolt will override the case head, causing a failure to feed. The LAR-15 pistol mags have too wide of a spine, but after I clamped it down with a vise, it fits and functions perfectly. The original Norinko mags are super reliable. I have never had a malfunction with it, up until the point where I practiced reloading with that mag so much that the feet lips are beaten to shit. But because of the reliability of the original magazine, I have no doubts that the QBZ-95 magazines work fine on their domestic rifles. The safety selector? Yeah, it's disastrous. I have no words to defend it. I have this Picatinny rail adapter up here for a red dot. You can see the iron sights through this rail. I have shot iron sights only for the first few hundred rounds, and yeah, they're okay. The rear peep tends to disappear a little bit under low light, 
but it's usable. I really like the contour of the forend. Once you choke up on this bump here, and wrap your pointer finger around the shelf at the front, you have very good control of the muzzle. You can also see that I have mounted a Magpul Moe rail section directly on the heat vents. It's on pretty tight, and while your D-balls or peg 15s won't hold zero on there, it's perfect for a poverty tier Amazon flashlight. Or a hand grenade. Before I conclude, I would note that the T97 NSR Gen 2 and Gen 3 have solved a lot of the problems of the original T97. They added a beveled magazine well, an ambidextrous mag release, and a modified feed ramp that seems to solve a lot of feeding issues with various magazines. The safety is also enlarged, but the placement is still horrendous. I have no experience on the Gen 2 and Gen 3 T97s, so I will not comment any further. That concludes my analysis of the QBZ95 small arms family. I would say that the export QBZ97 is definitely the ugly duckling of the bunch, neglected by its parents. The original QBZ95 lineup is functionally a very solid design, but lacks in the user experience department, especially with that fire selector. But it still wins over the QBZ97 in terms of the magazine release. By the time the QBZ95-1 came around the block, we can see that the design has fully matured, both in functionality and ergonomics. I would say that it can definitely stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with all the major service rifles out there, which is to be expected from a global superpower. I'd say that the only thing that remains sort of a problem with the QBZ95-1 is modularity, but the aftermarket rail certainly resolved most of that. The real estate on these rails leaves a bit to be desired, but the people who are using them seems to be managing fine. And let's be honest, the average Chinese grunt is probably only running an issued optic like the YMA series or the newer QMK-171. Maybe a flashlight and a laser, which can be taken care of by the proprietary dovetail rails on the front side tower. And really, I wouldn't fault any firearms designed before the 2000s for lacking modularity. I don't think that at that point, anyone expected the proliferation of firearms accessories like we've seen today. Ambidexterity is also a mostly resolved problem with the forward ejection angle of the 95-1. You can see some left-handed people out there being pretty comfortable behind the Dash 1 in various shooting positions. I think that the newly adopted QBZ191 with its ambidextrous safety, collapsible stock, and full-length Picatinny rails is certainly a better choice for the elite troops that has the training and hardware that can make the most out of these features. But nevertheless, the QBZ95-1 still has its place among the grunts, and it's not obsolete nor even obsolescent on the battlefields of the 21st century. Also, please, Norinko, give us a QBZ97-1. I'm tired of this safety. While you're at it, make the longbow rails a standard feature too. Thanks. And thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been informative and entertaining. Bye-bye.